Hi everyone, welcome back to science. We're going to be continuing with our second lesson in uh, chapter two. Um, this is going to be lesson 2.2. So just as a reminder, um, if you want to be starting to grab a piece of paper and a pencil, that would be super helpful for you today. Um, most of today is going to be a reading, but on our next slide, there is going to be some questions that you're going to want to answer and jot down your ideas. Um, but also, as we do the reading today, it could be super helpful for you to be uh, making some annotations and jotting some notes down on your piece of paper um, as we go throughout the unit today. So let's go ahead and jump in. If you need to pause the video now to grab a piece of paper and pencil, um, go ahead and do so. We're going to get started with our warm up. So uh, our warm up today, there are four images that you're going to want to look at. And you're going to want to use the images to answer some questions below. So just as kind of a heads up in our images, we've got a image of a gorilla and an image of a mole, which is a creature that burrows and lives underground. As you can kind of see, um, it's coming up out of its hole there and it's covered in some dirt. And then we've got a picture of a similar structure that they have, which in our last unit, we started to talk about how structures can be similar but also different. So what we're going to start to be thinking about is what are some of the ways that these structures are similar and different. So here are the questions you're going to want to go ahead and start to jot down on that piece of paper and your pencil. Really want to push you to be thinking about using some strong observations when you are describing the shapes of their hands. You can use the uh, picture up here or the image of the skeletal structure of those. Um, but really focus on making sure that you are creating detailed descriptions. And then questions two and four are going to be asking you to start to think about why might you think that those uh, structures, their hands, are shaped the way that they are. So go ahead and pause the video now. If you haven't grabbed a piece of paper and a pencil, you're going to want to do that and then take uh, a few minutes to answer questions one through four. Again, go ahead and pause now and then we'll rejoin here in just a few moments. Okay, so hopefully you had um, a little bit of an opportunity to start to think about those structures and um, were able to remember that some of those structures are going to start to be um, influenced by some of the different ways that those animals are using them. One of the vocabulary words that we're introducing today is this idea of stability. Like I said earlier, we're going to be completing a reading, and as we're reading, you're going to be hearing about populations that were stable, and then you're going to also be hearing about some populations that weren't stable. So when I hear the word stable, I tend to think of um, building a house and whether or not it's stable and if, if it's gonna fall over or not. So if you're thinking about that, it's a little bit different when we use um, the idea of stability in thinking about evolution. Stability in evolution has to do with if a species is going to stay mostly the same over time. If that species is changing, we would say that that species is not stable. And just as a reminder, with evolutionary history, this is not something that's going to be happening overnight. This is going to be something that happens sometimes over millions and millions of years because it takes a specific population a long time to change. So some of the times that stability uh, on our evolutionary scale is a really, really long time period. So as we go through the reading today, you may have some really great reading uh, strategies that you use every day. I want to encourage you to make sure you're using strategies that help you to best learn. I'm just going to highlight a few things that you would want to be thinking about as we're going through the reading today um, that strong readers would want to practice and that's going to help you to lock this uh, information into your brain. So first one is to think carefully about what you're reading, which is kind of obvious. But some of the times you want to be making sure that when we are doing this, if there's something that you don't understand, that's okay. You don't always understand it the first time you read it. You want to go back, realize when you don't understand something as well, and go back and reread it. If you do understand it, that's great. 
and hopefully you're paying attention to the times where you do and don't understand things. Second thing, that's why you've got your piece of paper so that you can annotate the text and record some of your thinking as you go through. I'm a huge note taker. It really helps me to process and understand things if I slow down and take some notes as I'm going. You also have access to the Amplify reading. You can open that up and create some annotations and some highlights, maybe type in some notes on that as well. Always for scientists, we wanna be considering our visuals that we have in our reading and thinking about how those can help us to deeper our understanding. And then the last thing I'm gonna ask you to do today is to discuss some of your thinking with someone who you are close to. So that may mean you call up your friend, maybe you talk to your mom or dad or your brother or sister, or grandma or grandpa. If you're not in class, hopefully you can find somebody to kind of explain to them what you learned because that's gonna be something that, again, helps you as a reader to lock in that information. Okay, so what we're gonna go ahead and do is start the reading. This is the reading we're gonna be looking through today. It's called, Where Do Species Come From? And if you do have access to Amplify readings at home, I would strongly encourage you to open this up for yourself and complete the reading independently. That's gonna really push you as a reader and help you grow as much as possible in, uh, with your reading level and your ability to understand this as a scientist. If you don't have access to the reading at home um, or if you're someone who wants a little bit of extra support, I want to encourage you to follow along reading as I read. So as a reader, it's really important that you're not just listening, but if you want to be improving your reading while you're listening to someone else read, it's critical that you follow along and make sure you are reading to the best of your ability in your head as I read aloud today. So those are, those are your two options. We're going to go ahead and get started with this first section. And then I'm gonna talk about the rest of the reading is pretty long. We're gonna talk about how we might split that up and how you might decide what section you wanna read so you uh, don't necessarily need to read the entire article. So let's go ahead and jump in with this intro that everyone is gonna to wanna to read from the beginning of uh, our article for today, which is called, Where Do Species Come From? Evolution is not just a thing of the past. It's happening all the time. That means new species are evolving today. There are many ways in which species can evolve, but one type of evolution occurs when one species is divided into more than one population living in different environments. If these populations live in different environments for many, many generations, they may evolve so many differences that they no longer resemble the same species. What used to be populations of the same species become populations of a different species. So just wanna remind you before we start this next paragraph that when we're talking about generations, that can be millions and millions of years. So even if we look at a species today in our lifetime, it may seem like it's stable, but if we were to come back in a million years, we might see some changes that actually lead us to believe that that species uh, could have actually been unstable. The process of one species evolving into two or more different species is called speciation. Speciation often starts when populations are separated by a barrier, such as a body of water or a mountain range. After they are separated, the populations don't encounter one another regularly anymore. They become separate populations, and over time they may evolve into different species. To learn more about some populations, that were divided into different environments and became different species, choose one of the chapters that follow. So now moving forward, you're gonna have the option to select one of three different species to read about. And of course, if you're interested in all three, I would really encourage you to go ahead and read about all three. They're all, in my opinion, really interesting species. And this idea of speciation, and the way that they're going to be splitting off into different populations is pretty cool. So I'll give you a rundown of your options to pick through. And again, if you wanna read about all three, that is great. So the first option you have is you can read about these uh, Galapagos tortoises, which are a really, really um, unique species. 
So there's the pages on those. If you are interested in the Galapagos tortoise, um, I'll give you some time to go back and pause and read through this if you don't have access to the reading at home. The one that I picked for me personally is we're gonna read together about the polar bears. I love polar bears and I think that it's a pretty cool story about how polar bears came to be. So we're gonna be reading about the polar bears together on this video. And then the last option that you've got is flightless ducks. So take a second to think about which one you might want to read about. I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna ask you to pause, I should say, if you wanna read about the flightless ducks, I'm gonna slowly click through those slides so that if you are wanting to read those at home and you don't have access to the Amplify curriculum, you can just go ahead and pause the video and read now. So if you're really interested in flightless ducks, here's the first page. Here's our second page that you can pause and read. And here's the final page on the flightless ducks that you can pause and read. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the beginning. So if you've decided at this point that you wanna read about the Galapagos tortoises, Here's the first page, go ahead and pause now and read through that. And then if you want to read about the Galapagos tortoises, here is the second page that you would be reading through. Okay, so as a group, if you are following along in the video and you're wanting to read with me, we're gonna be reading about the polar bears. So let's jump in, I love polar bears. I think they're really unique. Um, and they are a, a species right now um, in, the, in the planet that we have that are really struggling um, to be able to survive with climate change. So I think it's pretty interesting this, to read this article and see why did they develop in the first place. All right, so where do polar bears come from? The story starts with brown bears. About 400,000 years ago, Earth experienced an unusually warm period that allowed forests to grow in far northern areas of the Arctic. Some brown bears moved north into the new forest in search of food. When colder climates returned and the land was covered in ice and snow again, the descendants of the brown bears that had moved north were stuck in the ice-covered Arctic. This population of brown bears became separated from the population of brown bears in the southern regions. The bear's new environment in the Arctic was very different from the environment of forested land further south. The Arctic is a cold ocean environment with sheets of ice covering huge areas of water in the winter. The entire landscape is often covered with ice and snow. In this environment, different traits were adaptive or helpful for the bear's survival than traits that were adaptive further south. Over many generations, the population of bears in the Arctic region changed. They evolved, for example, specialized teeth and fur that were adaptive in their new environment. Meanwhile, the forest environment farther south didn't change much at all. So the traits that were adaptive there didn't change either. The brown bear population that remained in the forest stayed similar to the ancestor population. Today, the body structures of the bears that live in the Arctic environment are different from those of the brown bears that live in the forest environment. The bears that live in the Arctic are a different species called polar bears. So here is a great picture, a great text feature for us to look at that shows those brown bears before they became polar bears and separated into a different species this is the type of environment that they would live in. Well, some of those bears, like it said, moved north and then suddenly their environment changed. How did that happen though? The populations of bears in the forest and in the Arctic both experienced natural selection over time. Bears have a random chance of being born with mutations that change their structures, such as teeth and fur. Some of these mutations resulted in changes that helped the bears in the Arctic survive in their environment. For example, some of the bears were born with back teeth. 
molars, which we also have as humans. They were jagged instead of flat. These jagged teeth help them chew and digest meat better than bears with flat molars that were adapted for eating plants. In the cold ocean environment of the Arctic, bears could walk out into the ice and catch seals resting on the ice. Seal meat, was, seal meat was a key food source for bears in the Arctic, and jagged teeth that helped them chew and digest seal meat were an adaptive trait. Eventually, the jagged teeth mutation, which allowed the bears to thrive on a diet of seals, became a common structure in the Arctic bear population. Bears that could chew and digest seals were more likely to survive and reproduce than bears without jagged teeth. Having jagged molars was not only an adaptive trait for the bear population in the Arctic, random mutations also resulted in fur that appears white. It is actually transparent, which is pretty cool. Bears born with transparent fur had a hunting advantage because they were able to blend into their snowy background while sneaking up on prey. Scientists think that transparent fur also helps bears stay warmer in colder temperatures because transparent fur does a better job of trapping body heat than brown fur does. Staying warmer and being able to hunt more efficiently both mean having a better chance of surviving and reproducing, which also means passing on genes for transparent fur to their offspring. Over time, polar bears became a separate species from brown bears. Changes that result in one species becoming two species do not happen in a single generation. This process of speciation takes place slowly as adaptive mutations build on one another over many generations, adding up to big changes in body structures. Polar bears did not become a new seal-eating species with fur that appears white as soon as their environment became icy. In fact, it took a long time for bears to adapt to that environment. As they adapted, bears born with jagged molars and transparent fur became more and more common until the population began to look like the polar bears we see today. So that was our section on the polar bears. To wrap up today, what I would love for you to do is make sure that you found some information that started to help you to think about the idea of stability and start to think about what were some of the factors that caused the population to either become stable or unstable. These are some ways that you can go back and mark some annotations if you have access to that Amplify reading at home. If you don't, hopefully you jotted down some ideas or you can go back in this video. And to wrap up, as you think about finishing up today, I just want to really encourage you to make sure that you're sharing some of what you learned today um, with someone around you or calling a friend, um, letting someone you know live with, so that that information really stays locked in your brain. I'll look forward to talking with you when we start lesson 2.3.